Hey, hey. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Red Jackson back with another live stream here on YouTube. Today we have a very, very special guest. Michael Jackson's former backing vocalist and musical genius, Ken Stacy. But before we bring on the special guest, I'd just like to thank you guys for the incredible response I've received for my previous video, my interview with Michael Jackson's bodyguard, Jimmy Van Norman. It's reached over 70,000 views already, and it's tracking to reach even more very, very soon. So I'd like to thank you. I've gained loads of new viewers and subscribers, so I'm really, really glad that you're all enjoying my videos. So now is the moment you've been waiting for. Unlike Ryan Gosling, he's not just Ken. Please welcome the wonderful Ken Stacy. Here we go. Hey, there Hello, there. Ken. Hi, Red. How are you? I'm great. So, so pleased to be chatting with you from here in Wales, UK. Where are you calling from? I love it. I'm in Woodland Hills, California, and I am Welsh, just to let you know. No way. Yes, I for am. Real? <laughs> yes, wow. For real. Wow. Most people I talk with have no idea where, where Wales is. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm Welsh. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing, just like Elton John. <laughs> like Elton, Jones, he's Welsh. Many others. Oh, yeah, Did, Elton, yes. Didn't know that. Yes. I knew Tom Jones was, but Elton John. Yeah. Elton's Welsh, yes. Wow. And you worked with Elton for quite a while as well, I didn't did. you? I did, yeah, wow. for a couple of years. Awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to get chatting with that Thank later you. on. But to great. start off, can you briefly tell me a bit about your sort of beginnings in the music industry? You know, what inspired your vocal style? Well, uh, it's very interesting. I kind of stumbled into being a singer, let alone a professional singer. I remember as a child singing and I loved singing. Um, I used to kind of sing just to kind of calm and soothe myself, I guess. It was something that yeah. I just enjoyed. And when I was a little kid, I used to have dreams. This is what trips me out. Uh, at night, I would pull the covers over my head and I would create this like black canvas, right? You, you couldn't see anything. I'd yeah. open my eyes. And I used to imagine that I was in the Jackson Five. <laughs> 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 so who knew years, years later, right? I wasn't in a Jackson, but with Michael. Yeah. Um, but uh, when I was in college, I had some friends, one in particular that was already a professional musician, a, a guitarist named Ron Cohen. And he had a friend named David Vanacore, and they had a group of musicians. and. They used to play around down, mostly like corporate, like weddings and things like that. But it was a yeah. way for musicians to make a, a living. And a lot of the people that played in their bands and this particular band ended up becoming very successful musicians in their careers. So Ron knew that I loved to sing just for fun. And one thing led to another. I was going to go to law school. Uh, I was taking all the exams. I was getting ready to yeah. choose the school. And... Um, uh, they asked me to be in a band. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I don't know what this is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's something, uh, it, it makes me believe in past lives. Honestly, there was something hmm. in it that resonated so deeply. There was a part of me that already had knew what it was. Just like the first time uh, in junior high, I got on a pair of skis. They took a bunch of kids up to the mountains if you wanted to go. And the first time I picked up my skis, I, I, it's like I'd already been in skis before. And they were teaching yeah. me things that they weren't teaching the other kids. So there was something about it, like that maybe a past life I heard. I was a, maybe I was a, a yodeler in the Alps and, you know, they, they get all that. But um, they asked me to be in the band. Uh, we had our first concert experience at a, a very well-known concert club in the San Fernando Valley out here in Los Angeles called the FM station. The place was packed. We did a bunch of original songs, which songwriting, I didn't, I just started doing it with them. And yeah. uh, it was like the ever ready battery bunny, right? It was like yeah. I was plugged in for the first time in my life and just running back in the stitch. I was a really introverted kid and a young man and something about that just completely turned me on. So I knew that my LSAT, which are the exams getting in law school, those exam scores were good for a year. So I went back to my family and said, I don't know what this is, but there's something going on here. And I want to take a year and I want to see what this is going to be. And then I just kept going. 
And, mm. uh, y- you know, um, and by the way, your questions, and thank you for letting me see these in advance, Red, your questions are wonderful. Very, I do a lot of interviews and I really enjoy the thoughtfulness of your questions. I would say as far as a vocal style, you know, I came up on, on 70s rock and roll pretty much mostly. Um, cool, cool. So at least at that time, Elton, um, Journey, Foreigner, yeah. Bad Company, Aerosmith, uh, really started getting into prog rock like Yes, uh, Led Zeppelin. So you had a lot of bands like that were in front, and the singers, I'll, I don't need to list all the vocalists name off in these bands, but we all know where they are. So they yeah. kind of all had an impact, but I will tell you that as I grew as a vocalist, the number one vocalist that truly I resonate with is Donny Hathaway. Um, Donny was when I really discovered more of the more soulful nature of my voice and more as they call blue eyed right. soul. I don't know something about Donny, his voice, the the stunning beauty of it, the extraordinary e- effortlessness through which he sings with such a beautiful, warm, yet powerful voice. Uh, the heartfelt nature of it, the, the pain, the beauty, all of it. So Donny Hathaway, yeah. probably number one. But then I, I also love a vocalist like Bono. You know, I love the raw nature of Bono, who, you know, yeah. he's not a great, great singer, but he's got this commanding style and, a, and an assertive assurity in his voice that is so incredible um, that I love that, too. And and so like somebody like a Dylan, you know, can barely sing his way out of a paper bag, but there's something genuine and real and yeah. honest in his voice. So I, I really love great technical singers, but I also really, really love singers that sing and connect to you from their heart, even if all they have are five notes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, personally, even though, you know, growing up in modern times, yeah. I, I much prefer, you know, sort of more music from, you know, 70s, 80s. That, yeah. That's my thing, really. That's you know, cool. That's of great. Course, Michael Jackson. I've recently discovered Van Morrison. Oh, sort of soulful music. So that, that's oh, my thing yeah. at the moment. And then in a contemporary style, Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran is yeah. a modern Van Morrison. You know, yeah. it's like you hear Ed, and for somebody who didn't know Van Morrison, they might go, oh my God, Ed's amazing. And he is. He's incredible. His songwriting, yeah. his vocal styles, how he incorporated looping and was very innovative in what he did d- does mm-hmm. on his own. But when you know from prior, if you've been already exposed, you're like, that's Van Morrison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In contemporary style. So nobody's recreating the wheel here or nobody's, you know, it's always being regenerated. Everybody's influenced yeah. by somebody else. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's great to know. We, we see that in, you know, so many artists these days. Loads of them have been inspired by Michael Jackson, of course, as well. Very much so. And Michael was... Uh, such a unique vocalist, if you think about it. And if you think about when Michael was coming up uh, with his brothers, you know, during the Motown era and all those extraordinary vocal artists, Motown artists that were influencing them. And you hear his singing style when he was a kid. It was like it was otherworldly. You'd never heard a, a boy sing like that before. Right. And yeah. talk about an old soul. And he had to recreate himself several times yeah vocal yeah, yeah. he when when a so many young child star artists would go by the wayside he then became a teenage artist and the jackson five grew into that era and then he broke off on his own and then he had he was working with quincy in that whole era and then began to expand even more and you know he even until the time of his passing you know i was fortunate enough to hear things that were being produced and worked on and even sang on a few of those things that unfortunately never got released. He was always innovating and always looking for new ways to expand what he was doing. Is yeah. Much like a prince, always innovating, always look for, looking for a new way to expand what he did. Um, yeah. But Michael's, you know, Michael's like a, a Mozart is, you know, a shooting star, one, one, yeah. one in a million, one in a few generations. So, yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah, he yeah. absolutely sort of, reinvented himself with every new album absolutely very much so and in corp- and had a sensibility about his audience and a sensibility because mm. he paid you know a brilliant human being who paid very close atten- attention to how 
the 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 craft of entertainment right yeah. that's why he was such a, a lover of film and musicals and charlie chaplin and the, and all these different you know spielberg as a director and all these different and all the great musicals he really paid attention to how people were were the audience was was impacted and transformed by what they saw and what they heard and none of that that they were seeing and her, her hearing just happened it was a craft yeah. and so he really studied the craft and really uh, innovated in his ability to bring elements oh i like that how that works and i see that impact and said, that's you know it's, that was his brilliance oh yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. I'd like to hop back a second sure. to when you just mentioned recording certain things for things that weren't released. Can you go into a bit more depth with that? Well, Michael was always working on things constantly. There's going to, you're, yeah. you know, it's kind of the iceberg theory where you're going to see 10%, you know, when you see icebergs, yeah. when you go up there, you're only, which is kind of crazy because icebergs can be massive. And yeah. to think that 90% of that is still down under the water is kind of hard to fathom. But that's the way it is with somebody like a Michael Jackson, who's so prolific. When he makes a mm -hmm. decision to put a record out, he didn't write just 10 or 15 or 20 songs. He wrote or co-wrote hundreds of songs. There's, It's always going. It's always happening. He's always either writing himself or partnering with other writers and producers in order to find something new, looking for something new, looking for that thing. And that's why... You know, when you're that prolific and that dedicated as a songwriter and as an artist, when you invest that kind of time and that energy, you get something really remarkable on the back end. But it's an, an extraordinary amount of work. So you have yeah. somebody like me who uh, at that time, a session singer who might get called by a producer who happens to be working on a new track song with Michael for Michael maybe with one of the co-writers or with Michael himself directly. And so those things are always going on. You just don't get to hear about them. Like when, yeah. when Prince passed away, he had a vault filled full of hundreds, <laughs> if not thousands of songs that nobody has heard. And, and yeah. unfortunately, you may never. So there's a lot of material there from Michael that um, we're probably never going to hear. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you think in, in a perfect world, he's an incredible artist. He has millions of fans. There's people all around the world that would love to hear new things by Michael. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, um, um, there's a lot of politics involved yeah. in that and legalities. And, uh, you know, you have songwriters and producers, it's sorry, and then you have the family who owns the rights and you have certain pub it's very complicated and then everybody's yeah battling each other for control of or if you put it out who gets to benefit from it and who gets to control it and and unfortunately it's all that that keeps beautiful amazing art uh from from being able to surface so yeah, yeah. that's what i mean by that i had sung on a few things around the time uh when michael and shortly after uh they were trying to complete some things after Michael passed. And unfortunately, by the time uh, they were ready to put it out, um, a lot of things I think were shut down because now yeah. nobody knew the path forward on how to legally put things out, so. That's interesting. So, yeah. you know, was that around the time of This Is It or was that, you know, way before? What sort of time period are we talking about? Mm, um, it was, yeah, it was roughly around that period uh that that when michael passed they were you had a lot of things going on right it's not yeah. just one thing um so michael's passing the bands and you know all those things are happening around that but ancillary to that now you have all the different projects that were going on you know michael yeah. wasn't just doing this is it you know he had ancillary to that he had production he had songs he had things that he had been working on with other people and other producers that at the same time were going going along because this is yeah. it was about a prior catalog mo really this was mm -hmm. about his body of work up to the point uh, greatest to hits point greatest hits putting together this extraordinary show uh that where each song was going to be a multimedia event it was going to be in and of itself which was perfect to capture Michael's vision because he, he thought that big, you know, and when you think of his videos, yeah. how incredible, this was going to, if you were in the audience, you were going to be wearing 3D glasses. There was going to be the biggest 
high definition 3D screen ever made. And you were going to be witnessing this and we were all going to be in that. You, It's almost like, uh, like they have this thing here um, uh, called the pageant of the masters where they put this big canvas up and they have artists paint, recreate great art, art works of art, but they'll leave out certain characters and then they'll paint somebody. And that person goes and that somehow they fashion them in where they sit in it and you see them going in it. And then all of a sudden you hear the music and then everybody gets in their position and stops and instantaneously, you instantaneously you think you're looking at the original work of art it's really crazy so yeah. we were going to on stage wow. the dancers the singers the band because of what we were going to wear because of objects that we were going to come in because of the screen and people wearing the 3d glasses you were going to be having this extraordinary immersive experience uh in every single song <laughs> so <laughs> it was going to be pretty mind-blowing and the and the movie yeah. For what it is, and I'm glad that they did it, you know, so everybody got a little glimpse. It didn't come close. You know, it was only, no. it really, no, it, was, it didn't fully capture what this was going to really be for, for the audience. So, yeah. yeah. Not your average concert. Not your average concert. That's why, that's why for, it was going to start at the O2 Arena and sit there, you know, uh, in residency for a couple of months. And on the day yeah. of his passing, they were putting 15 more shows in the in the in line. I mean, it wasn't just unbelievable. So, you know, we had apartments all set up. Uh, there was a lot there. There was a lot there. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And then and then we would move it to another continent, find another major venue, do it there for months, move it to another continent. So it was going to be residency in different places because there was no way you were going to pack this up in a bunch of vans and take <laughs> it to the next place. It just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. For sure. Do you yeah. think Michael was, you know, sort of at that age, you know, capable and up for doing that many shows and, you know, traveling all across continents? Because mm, I yeah. would have thought he went to sort of settle down a bit more. Well, I, I think that like many, like many artists, let's look at, for instance, and I know uh, you brought, we kind of briefly spoke about Elton. Yeah. Elton could have retired probably 10 years ago. But how do you do that when that's when you're that creative, when your whole life and a great, great purpose of your life and your existence was based around your creative art and sharing that with an audience? There is yeah. something I will tell you, having both sung behind great artists like Michael and Elton and also fronting a band like Ambrosia, there is an energy that you experience that cannot be found anywhere else. I'm a father. I know what it is to be a father. It's, you know, it's that to me is, you know, being a dad is one of the most extraordinary things in my life that I'll ever know. Um, being a husband, being a creative person, having friendships, having all these things that are enriching in their own unique way. Nothing replaces or can give you <laughs> what it feels like to be on a stage performing mm. for and having that experience with hundreds if not thousands or hundreds of thousands thousands of people there's yeah. just nothing that can replace that and when you are a person that that gravitates that towards that that makes the decisions that puts you there and it's not it's made for very few i think oftentimes people imagine oh i would love to be the person on the stage honestly you don't <laughs> <laughs> if you knew what it took to even be to give those kind of performances, if you knew what it was like afterwards, um, the energy, the ups, the downs, the emotions, uh, what it's like to have to take the stage when you physically don't feel well, which is often because you're exhausted, when uh, you just had an argument with another band member, with a manager, with with uh, you, when you, one of your partner back at home who's raising your kids while you, you know, I mean, you, it's, it, it's, 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 yeah. it's a otherworldly experience that most people would not have the, the, the fortitude for. And it's very difficult. Mm. But when you are somebody like a Mike, a Michael or an Elton, somebody of that ilk, somebody of that talent, somebody of that stamina and that, that kind of personality, mm. It, you know, it, you have to really ha have to feel like you're really, truly done. And now Elton, I think Elton finally has arrived at that place. And like I said, could have retired 10 years ago, 
but couldn't yeah. just couldn't do it. wasn't wasn't It's like ready. a craving. It is. It really is. It's a craving, and it, and you and for Michael, he went. He was you know fifty, and he had had some health issues, and he was uh, out of the limelight for a while. Um, and um, you know he had not finished. His soul had not finished not only creating and giving the world what his vision was because that that's what this show was going to be it was his it was his great vision but it was yeah. doing something for him personally you know he it was it was feeding him in a way that nothing else could in his life um and he had to keep going so your question is a good one would he have had the stamina i don't know that any any of us really would have i imagine at some point in time some of the shows would have been postponed or canceled. It wouldn't have surprised mm -hmm. me. Let's put it that way. Have okay. had we been able to pull off every show, that would have been incredible. We certainly would have aspired to that. But when you look at how the enormity of the show and the the number of shows, and it is listen, when artists are out there touring under normal circumstances, they cancel shows all the time. Things for a variety of reasons get canceled. So for whatever reason, Michael's stamina, our stamina, technical issues. There are all yeah. kinds of things that could have gone wrong <laughs> where a show would have been canceled. So, yeah. That's a great answer there. Now, I want to hop back even further to when you mentioned that you were originally pursuing a career in law, but yeah. you gave it up to go, you know, down the music sort of path. Yeah. At any point during the sort of beginnings of your music career mm -hmm. did you feel any sort of regret and did you ever consider you know going back to law and sort of finishing the whole music thing well again what a great question it's wonderful and um very insightful uh of you the answer is absolutely um you know especially when you're just building your career i was in my original band we were called the habit um, we had incredible musicians in this band, people that have all gone on to have in one way or the other really wonderful careers. Um, but at that time, you're all slugging it out. You're trying to, you know, trying to get signed as a group. We were a great band. It was an incredible band. We had, uh, we had, um, um, oh my God, Tom, Tom was on drums, Tom, Tommy. Oh, my brain. God, this is horrible. Hold on. Hold on. Bobby Birch. Bobby ended up being the Elton band for many years. He was, yeah. We had uh, we had Ron Cohen on guitars. We had um, David Vanacore on all the keys. Tom Walsh. God, sorry, Tom. Tommy Walsh on drums. Uh, and at, at varying times, we had all, we had David Cause. I don't know if your audience would know who David Cause is, but he's a world-renowned saxophonist, smooth jazz artist. Uh, we had a whole slew of different kind of musicians and people that used to come in before we solidified as the band. Um, yep. But anyways, great band writing great stuff. It was really, really cool. People were loving it. We were we had management. We had everybody trying to help us get a deal. And but it was bad timing. Um, Guns and Roses was about to completely turn the music industry upside down. And when they hit, we were not on that bandwagon. We were nothing like that. It's kind of like when grunge hit. That was yeah. it. It just completely turned, and if Changed you were the game, it completely. If you were a hair band from earlier on, and you were not, you were done. <laughs> yeah, it was done. It was like your time came and went. So we were more like a a, a, a Toto meets Journey meets Foreigner, a little bit of Bad Company, a little Aerosmith. We were kind of like that, but sophisticated rock, and that was done. So when yeah. that stopped. I was like, okay, what do I do now? So I started trying to build my career as a session singer. That is, it's all really hard work. So along the way, you get all kinds of questions of why aren't you famous and why aren't you da 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 ba 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 ba, and it can be really hard to endure that. So did I want to mm. go back to law school at times? Did I feel like I made a mistake? Sure, uh, I'm a skier. I think I mentioned earlier, I just, the first time I strapped yeah. skis on, I could just kind of ski. I remember many times adding everything up I had and thinking, okay, I've got this amount. I'm going to sell everything, take my money. I'm going to move to Colorado or Utah. I'm going to live in the mountains. I'm going to be a ski instructor. And I'm never going to tell anybody I sang or wrote something. And I can just let that all go. But fortunately, the, the, the desire in me 
was not going to let me do that. That's why it was so painful. If it wasn't painful, I could have walked away and it wouldn't have been anything. But it, I yeah. needed to do it. It was it's part of one of the reasons I'm here. And I had beautiful people in my life that said, no, you cannot give up. You cannot give up. Yeah. You have to keep going. Don't give up. Don't give up. So, you know, careers are up. They're down. They're around you. If you're in this for as long as I've been, which has been, you know, over 30 years, uh, probably getting close to 40 now, which is even hard to imagine. Yeah, it's getting close to 40 years. Um, wow. You 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 see your career go this way, go that way. Then you're here. Then you're there. Then you're retooling. Then technology changes. You have to change with it. This, it's an incredible road. It's a as yeah. as the Beatles say, it's a long and winding road, <laughs> <laughs> and it truly is. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I sort of assume a lot of it is just about kind of maintaining that drive, that passion, that sort of and then persevering with it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And that's a good word. You must persevere. You must persevere. I don't know. Look, not to get too morose, but listen, we, we, we are all born, we live this life, and then we all pass. And I don't know where I was before I came here. And I don't know what happens next. All I know is I'm here now, right? You're a young yeah. man, you have this beautiful all these all this potential of life ahead of you you're doing this amazing podcast uh, video cast uh, your show it's a, a fantastic you know i admire a young person like yourself who is passionate about what you're doing your your questions are very thoughtful clearly clearly i get from you that you're very passionate now this was brought up the other day i was watching a, a, a movie i was watching the series uh, we just finished it, Killing Eve. Amazing with Sandra O oh and all the I amazing. That, yeah. Right. Amazing. And a lot of it based out of, by the way, London. And and I think it was an English developed uh uh production. Anyways, okay. or yeah, British. Um, but really amazing, Killing Eve. And in one of the scenes, they say, What is passion? People think it's oh, it's love, it's this. No, the word passion actually comes from the term uh, i think it's a latin term to suffer to suffer so you uh, you know if you often hear people suffer for their art they suffer yeah. for their art and we immediately think oh you're suffering oh no no that's not why would you ever want to suffer i'm a dad i suffer all the time why because i care i think about my son i think about his welfare I think about what his future is going to look like. I think about what he's going through as a young, as a teenager, moving into now into manhood. All the feelings that I went, the feelings that you go through, the feelings we all go through now that I'm going through this chapter in my life. We all suffer. You cannot escape suffering in life. So why not be thoughtful about it? Why not suffer for things you really believe in, right? I believe in being a great dad. I believe in being the best husband I can be and the best person I can be. I certainly believe in suffering for my art because I want it to have value. I want it to matter in the world. So I'm going to suffer for it. Therefore, I'm willing to be passionate. So, you know, for your audience, if you have an, your audience out there that are, are aspiring uh, creatives or in whatever they aspire to be, be willing to be passionate, be willing to suffer for it because it's only in that suffering that you're going to, on the other side, become a deeper, richer person. And with, with perseverance, get better at the craft of whatever that is. And, and I would imagine if I'd continue to go down the path of being an attorney, I would have been willing to suffer to be the best attorney I could be, right? Because I want to do good in the world. That's my right. aspiration. So, um, yeah. <laughs> wow, I, that's that's really interesting. Such a great way of putting it. Thank you. Wow. So before we get to talking about this, is it you know in mm -hmm. deeper? I'd like to sort of touch on. You've had an interesting career in the sense of you've worked both behind artists and fronting. Mm -hmm. You were the frontman for the band Ambrosia. Yes. So how does that sort of compare, you know, in general, as far as the responsibility and the whole sort of energy you get from that? Mm. Excellent question. And 
there are similarities and there are differences for sure. Um, so if I think first and foremost about, well, it, it really, if I think about it, when I first started any aspiration in music, I was a front man, right? I was the front man in my band, yeah. The Habit, right? Um, so that had tremendous responsibilities. Whenever you're the front person in a band, whether it's Michael, Elton, me, now Ambrosia, I didn't create the band, but I had replaced the original singer, the uh, main lead singer. So um, the, when you are the front person, there is a responsibility on your shoulders unlike anybody else in the band. Um, for instance, I can feel crummy and I can still pick up the guitar and I can and I can play. I may not play as, I may have to be a little bit more thoughtful and aware, but the guitar is here. And unless I have an injury to my arms, <laughs> right, or anything like that, if let's say I have a flu, I've got this or that, um, I could be in a bad mood and I can still play. I can, do, yeah. yeah. When you're a singer, you're the living, breathing instrument, just like the guitar in your hands. For instance, yeah. you talk to any guitarist, you tune your guitar up backstage or in the green room, you bring it out to the, to the stage and maybe the temperature is different out there. All of a sudden, the guitar is out of tune. The guitar suffers. <laughs> now you have to tune it again. And get the, <laughs> the instrument is an, is an analog, living, breathing thing that is impacted by its environment, right? Not, my piano is not working here, my digital piano and my system. Those samples are sampled from a real piano and it sounds beautiful, but I don't care yeah. how many times I hit it and I don't care where I bring my computer. It's going to sound the same every single time because it's not, unless you get into the computer and change the ones and zeros, it's going to yeah. be the same every single time. I'm not a computer. I'm a real living, breathing thing. Therefore, emotions, feeling, exhaustion, energy, uh, the audience, um, it, it, there are a million different reasons why when, when I'm about to take that stage and have to be the voice or the main focus, yeah. the, the tip of the spear, if you will, that comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility. That I means bet. that I have to find, I can't tell you, Red, how many times I had to dig so phenomenally deep to find energy, emotional, physical, spiritual energy, when there was a moment when I just wished I was anywhere else but right then and there. But then I get on the stage and there's an audience. <laughs> Adrenaline kicks in. You feel that you realize, if you realize these people took time and money and they, they're the reason you even get to do this in the first place. So you have to find it within yourself to tap into reserves. And it's very hard. It's very, very hard. Uh, but again, it comes back to the willingness to have passion, to suffer. When you're a background yeah. singer, um, it, it it's not the same thing. And it has its challenges. Your job is when I was, for instance, with Elton, um, I was kind of uh, uh, tasked because of the way I sing um, and a familiar familiarity or familiar quality in my voice. I was often tasked with doubling Elton on certain songs because he's the front guy. And again, for a variety of reasons, he could be tired. So he may need some help or some reinforcement or in the studio on the original recordings. That's what they had. Maybe he doubled himself, tripled himself, and they folded that back into the mix. You don't necessarily hear it, but that's why it sounds bigger and stronger. Yeah. So you need that live. So that has a responsibility. I remember the first time I met Elton and was singing behind him. Uh, it was for the Road to El Dorado uh, tour to support the soundtrack for this movie called The Road to El Dorado. He wrote the music with Tim Rice. And it was this really cool, very cutting edge, uh, um, uh, I hate to use that, uh, animated, animated film, really, really cool. And uh, we were at this very famous uh, small theater room uh, up in San Francisco. And um, it, it, I'd never met him. We'd been rehearsing it for months. And I was given this song from the soundtrack where it was a constant uh, third harmony from him, top to bottom, just me and him, constantly singing through the whole song, tight, 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 third harmony all the way through. 
Elton is notoriously loud. His monitors are deafening. <laughs> and normally he's isolated. His, the stage he plays on is big normally, right? Well, this was a small space. He was right in front of us where we were. His back to, was to us. His, his monitor array was all around him, deafening loud. I was behind him with Billy Trudell and Nigel Olson, who had just come back into the band. Um, I was tasked with singing with him. We were running soundcheck, and we decided to run 16th Century Man and soundcheck. Well, not only could I not hear him, or bear, no, not hear myself, and was deaf about how loud his thing was, I couldn't see him, and he changed the melody. And I'm oh. like, okay, I've never met him. This is the first time singing with him. This is going to be televised. This is going to be recorded for posterity. Who do you think they're going to point the finger to? Elton John <laughs> or that stupid background singer who screwed up all the background parts? Yeah. I was panicked. I was panicked. I pointed it out to Davy Johnstone, his MD. He talked to Elton. Elton's amazing. He probably listened to it once and was, oh, yeah, yeah, this is what it is. But I was, I'd never performed, you know, I was, ah. Oh. As a matter yeah. of fact, right before we went on stage at this particular venue, you it's old school. You go into the stage through the kitchen. So I'm like, I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I literally went over to a corner and started shadow boxing because I had to get the anxiety out. And I, in my mind, I said, okay, if this is the beginning and the end of my career right now, <laughs> I'm going to go out fighting. This is the kind of, you know, you see that movie 20 feet, you know, 20 feet from fame, you know, all these background singers that you go through a lot of stuff. It's a very different kind of thing. And it can yeah. have its trials and tribulations and it can come with its own own emotional uh, complexities. Why aren't I the one up there? Sometimes you're a better singer than the person you're backing up. You know, there are all kinds of things. You're an incredible artist singer that could just sing anybody under the table i'm not saying that's me but there are some really incredible singers that have been the backing singers and they never get to be the ones up front because yeah. you're not built for it you think you are but you're really not you want to be and if you were there then you'd be the one up there but you're not it's so complicated yeah so they both have great complexities they both have great complexities. Not only that, but if you're a background singer, I love Elton. I love Michael. You know, had Michael lived and we had continued to do his tour for years to come, it would have been incredible, an incredible blessing financially, all the things that come with it. You, you know, you are put up in beautiful places. You're fed wonderfully. You make great money. You get to be a star because you're ancillary to the thing. All these things happen, right? But at the end of yeah. the day... Are you singing your music? Are you being the artist? You might as well be in a, in, you're, you're basically at the end of the day, you're a well-paid cover singer singing, not even not even singing the leads, singing the backgrounds. You you might as well be in a highly paid uh, a wedding band. I mean, at the end of it, you're not. So there's a lot there. You spend yeah. your lifetime singing other people's music and not your own. And there are a lot of, Cheryl Crow started out as a background singer and backed other singers. She was able to claw her way and make her own a career. There are zillions of Cheryl Crows out there that you'll never hear about, male and female, because they couldn't break free. They just couldn't mm -hmm. break free. And that can be in and of itself incredibly heartbreaking. And when you put all your energy yeah, it's supporting, tough. it is. Now you're touring all the time. Where's the time for you to be pursuing your own career? So yeah. it's very, it's very challenging. So hopefully that kind of illustrates but that I, I'm not complaining in a, in a tr look, I feel tremendously grateful that I'm here talking to you now about a career that I've been doing for all these years. And I still get to do it, even if it looks different from what it was multiple other ways in over the past almost 40 years. But it comes with a lot. It comes with a lot. You have to move through a lot of emotion, a lot of feelings, a lot of tremendous ups and downs personally, financially, creatively, um, in every way. So it's a very good question. And it's, it's not an easy thing to answer. But I will yeah. tell you, there is something very, very unique. Uh, you know, my last touring experience was with Ambrosia right before the pandemic hit. I'd been with them uh 
I came back with them in the mid 2013s. Um, I had been with them briefly from 2006 to 2008. Then the opportunity came, which I know is one of your questions. How did I end up with Michael? And, and yeah. I'll get into that in a second. Um, and then I went on to work with Michael when, pardon me, when Michael passed, Dorian Holly was um, in the band, in the band for American Idol. And he was also, no, he was a, a sorry, was in the band. He was a, a, one of the vocal coaches on American Idol and the band left to, to go to the Tonight Show and yeah. they brought him with him and he recommended me and that's how I got the gig. And we can go deeper into that. Um, but all these things transpired and then um uh in 2013 i reconnected with the band uh with ambrosia and they asked me to fill a couple of dates where their lead current lead singer couldn't do it and that's how i ended up being back in the band um right. but i was in a very different place then and in the last couple of the years that i was with ambrosia i made a very distinct uh, decision and the decision was my career was always built around did you like what i just did in other words i wanted you to tell me how great i was and and i needed that validation i needed somebody to tell me oh you sing great you blah 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 blah, blah. it got to the point with ambrosia where i was so sick and tired of holding that giving all that power away to an audience, to band members, to other people, to ban other bands we shared the stage with and all this stuff. And I was like, is that the purpose? Is that really the purpose of why I do what I do? Yeah. <laughs> and I finally decided, no, that's not it. And I, I worked very hard at letting that go. And now is about really taking the stage, knowing that I had a purpose and knowing that my purpose as the front man of Ambrosia was to open my spirit up, open my heart, and let this music move through me and pour this energy out onto the audience with no expectation of anything in return, nothing at all, that my job was to be the conduit of energy and that it was going to land on everybody different and each person in that audience was there for a reason and was not, was not in my pay grade to know why uh, and that they were all going to walk away from that experience with a different experience of their own. And that's why I was there. I was there to serve that purpose and to do it with love and to do it with, with very clear intention. So I used to, when we'd have these shows, we'd close, for instance, we'd close the evening with their biggest hit, which is called Biggest Part of Me. And it's a really beautiful, very powerful and really rangy and big, big, big love song, big song to sing, especially after a 90 minute show. And I would look for all the, not the, not the really, for instance, you'd see all kinds of people here. You'd see the really pretty people that were used to getting all the attention in life. You'd see people that were just comfortable. And then you'd see people that you could tell for whatever reason felt more reserved, less important, not seen. Uh, you could mm. see it. Those were the people that I would go to because I felt like that I was given the honor of letting them know they're seen. They matter too. And it was an unbelievable experience to see somebody suddenly transform, walk out into yeah. the audience, grab the hand of somebody that was like, oh, God, oh, God, bring them up and, and then, you know, hold them for a second and dance with them and sing one of the. It was so beautiful. It was that's when it started feeding my soul. That fed yeah. my soul more than anybody telling me anybody anything about whether they liked how I sang or not or whatever. Who cares? Right. What does that matter? I mean, I know I sing. I know I can sing well. I don't need anybody to tell me that I'm... Yeah. Because for anybody that tells me how great they think I sing, there's going to be somebody else that doesn't like the way I sing. And what am I supposed to go through the world and make 8 billion people like me? <laughs> <laughs> so it came down to me recognizing my purpose and focusing on purpose. And I think yeah. as, uh, as what you do with your show... Uh, you know, the sooner, and I love how at your age and for anybody watching, the sooner you can begin to dis, to, to tap into this, the, I think your life's going to change. I think whatever your asp aspirations are as a creative or anything else you do in your life, if you begin to look, how can I bring something good into the world? How can I have gratitude for the opportunities I have, the responsibilities I have uh, what in whatever it is that I do? 
I can be an agent agent for something positive, right? Yeah. I can connect with people and and through my intention and through uh, my heart, um, bring something good into the world. I don't know how I got on that tangent, but I guess because your question inspired me, you you brought up a good question. Is there a difference? And they both have their roles, and I can serve that same purpose as a background singer, but it doesn't quite have the same potency as to when you're in the person in the front. Yeah. But still, that makes a lot of sense. But I will tell you, Red, people have felt I since then I have had the opportunity to be to do some events and things where I'm a background singer and I bring that same intention and I bring it to the song and I bring it to the person I'm backing up and I bring it to the band and the audience and people do notice it and they do feel it. They still feel it. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful insight there. Thank you, Ken. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go on to talk about This Is It in some yeah. more depth, mm -hmm. let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of this live stream and take a very quick break. We'll be back in just a few moments. And there we go. Thank you to the sponsor of this live stream, myidol.com, for making it happen. Yeah. Now, we've had a question from a viewer here mm -hmm. for you, Ken. Great. If you could sing one more song with Michael, what song would you choose? Oh, my gosh. What a great question. Tricky one. This is from Emma Dodd. Hi, Emma. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I have to say... There was something so transcendent when we did Human Nature. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, I know it's not the big number. I know it's yeah. not, you know, and there were so many incredible, it, you know, how do you choose one song over the other? But on stage, there was something extremely spiritual and transcendent. And the way Michael felt that song and the way he sang it and the way we would answer him in the backgrounds and yeah. And uh when we when when he passed and we were doing uh the um um the honoring him at the Staples Center, um, and John Mayer came out and did it on guitar. There it's it, there's something about that song and it's I don't know how to explain it for me, for me personally. So I would say it would probably be human nature. And, um, you know, it, in an interesting way, it almost kind of encapsulates when you think of the song human nature, right? Mm -hmm. Michael was an incredibly human being, right? Yeah. It's very easy to look, like, look at somebody like a Michael who, <clears throat> you know. Untouchable. Untouchable, almost otherworldly. And I get that. Yeah. I get that. But, you know, like I say, to me, you know, before there was Michael, there was a Mozart or there was earlier there was the Beatles. Or the, it, there's something that happens when a human being who pulls up their underwear and has to go to the bathroom and has to eat every day and can get ill and can have hu a full hum range of human emotions, just like you and me. But when somebody de decides to commit themselves passionately towards something, um something extraordinary happens. And I think that's the thing that I look at Michael the most 
uh, and and honor and respect and am in, and am inspired by, because yeah. just like you and me, a human being, he was born, he lived in a, a, an extraordinary and complex life, and now he's not here. But what lives on, and why are we to continue to talk about him? Because he was willing to be so phenomenally and extra, extra, extraordinarily committed and passionate about music and about being not just an entertainer to entertain, but an entertainer to open your heart and uplift mm -hmm. you and enlighten you. Um, that takes tremendous courage and it, and it has a cost and it has a toll. Um, and he was willing to do that. And I think that any human being, a teacher who is willing to pour themselves into being the best teacher and they're going out and spending their money for school supplies when you know there's no money there's no budget there when they're working with kids after school to help educate them and keep them off the streets these kind of people in the world 99.7 percent of them we don't get to see because they don't yeah. live in the realm like a michael lives in right which is entertainment and we all look at that but people like michael exist they exist all around us um michael is one of those people in our in my business that i look at uh, as that kind of an inspiration because he was willing to to do that. So human nature, somehow or another, there's something about yeah. it that just, the, uh, that apple, I want to take a bite. I want to, you know, why, why? Tell me, tell him it's just human nature. He's driven. It's, it's his humanity. It's his desire to taste, to feel, to experience. And the beauty of that, that just gets me. And, uh, yeah. and the delicacy of his voice. Oh, it just, yeah, kills me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd like to tag on to that a bit. Sure. Is there a certain song or even a certain part of a song that you find, like, exceptionally tricky? Was there a moment that was more challenging than the rest in mm. any way? Something you had to really, really rehearse to get right? Yeah. Uh, let me think about that for a second. Yeah. God. Um, <laughs> we, I had to be in the stratosphere on Annie, are you okay? Right? Not yeah. Judith and I were up there together. Oh my God. To be that accurate, <laughs> to just, yeah. Okay. Okay. And I think it was even a little higher than that. You had to get this really on the top. Right, you had to hit this just the way my right. would do it, right? And yeah. uh, it was that was challenging. That was challenging. Uh, I can imagine to hit that accurately and to pop it the way Michael does. One of the incredible things about Michael as a vocalist, very unique voice, right? Very, very unique voice. And Michael didn't think he was a great singer, by the way. Some singers what? don't. Yeah, yeah. But he, which is startling. He worked incredibly hard at his voice and he developed an incredibly unique style when we were doing all the pre-records. You can't do a show like that with just Michael up front and four background singers. It's not possible. You can't recreate, especially those later productions and even earlier productions. It relied so much on Michael multi-tracking and bringing in his sister and other incredible singers to multi-track and create these beautiful vocal arrangements around him, right? You can't yeah. get that. You have to have pre-records that you're singing live to, but the pre-records are there to support. Um, Michael always, had, artists always generally have that. Um, uh, so it's not fake. It's not like Michael's voice replacing him or us not really singing, but you do have the re reinforcement there. Um, when we were doing all the pre-records for the tour, he was so generous to us and he could have just kept it all his pre-records. Why not? It's his voice and it sounds incredible. But he did like the way the four of us sounded together. And I think he really wanted it to be as authentic to what we were bringing as possible. So we would, while, you know, while rehearsals were going on and say nobody was on stage at a time for a variety of reasons. Maybe the dancers are, are doing this. Michael's 
Michael's working on other stuff. So we didn't have time to go work on our choreography, which is a question you had. Uh, we would be, we, they would set up little mini studios for us on, on site. So we would go in there and do our pre-records and we would have the beautiful fortune of listening to Michael's isolated vocals. Oh my God. Ooh. Just like, wow. Oh, wow. Just, what the fans would give to hear oh, this. Oh my gosh. Oh, and just the way he, he was the most rhythmic vocalist. I And it is completely, once I worked with Michael, both as a singer, as a vocal producer, a ranger, and a vocal coach, it's completely changed. Ah, there we are. Oh my gosh. There you are. Wow, what a memory that is. That's crazy. It completely changed the way I approach voice now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, back. Hear me roar. <laughs> <laughs> I had to wear hats. I was like, I got to create a vibe here. Everybody's so vibing. I need a vibe. That's a classic. I got to do something. Um, <laughs> but it completely changed. So, one of the beautiful things about the way Michael would sing is, and it made sense is there was an incredible rhythmic it was like he he was a percussionist in his mouth along with being a melodic a melodic yeah. instrument right we think of ourselves yeah. as singers we're singing melodies but there's there's just like in percussion where you end a note how you end the note how you start it it's it needs to fall somewhere within the subdivision of the mm -hmm. rhythm and he learned this as a kid singing all those great hits in Motown and being around the most incredible. He learned that and then he cultivated the, oh, the band. I, let me tell you about that shot. That shot was yeah. a turning point for the band because up till that point, we're like, is this really going to happen? Can we pull this together? Is this all going to happen? When that photo op, when that photo session happened, we all hugged each other afterwards and went, this is this is happening. We're really, this is going to be extraordinary. We're it's doing real. this. And unfortunately, yeah. not too long after that, Michael, Michael had passed. Um, but yeah, the, the rhythmic quality of his voice, um, that was very challenging to, to learn uh, because mm -hmm. I'd grown up more, like I said, on rock. And I had grown up, you know, up to that point, um, Donny Hathaway, uh, Al Jarreau, <sighs> Stevie Wonder to some extent. I love Stevie. He's incredible. But I think because of the way I sing and the timbre I have, it led me more towards relating to Donny. I wasn't hmm. such a facey singer as, as Stevie is. Stevie is much more of a face. In other words, what I mean by that is when you hear a Stevie sing, you hear a lot of the front of his sound, a lot of nose. Donnie, you hear more of this in his voice, more of the space in his voice. Some singers are more naturally oriented towards the mask and some more here, and that's where I've tended to be. So when we started working, when I started working with the band and with Michael, I had to really reorient myself. And so that was, and circling back to your question, what was the hardest thing? You know, the right, hitting those, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Even now, it's a little, are you okay? Even though in the back end right now, I'm a little slow in getting to it. It's like you have to yeah. really ba -da -ba 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 -da, and really be able to execute that stuff on stage, live. You know, yeah, it's like agility it's almost. Right. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And when you hear, when, when we heard Michael's vocals isolated, it was like, oh, I get it now. He is like using his the, the, the efforts in his throat efforts in his mouth his articulators his lips he is and he is being a percussionist and a violin and a melodic instrument right sometimes right. a horn sometimes a violin sometimes a guitar right the way he'd grip these are all things you would do with your voice but the thing that knocked me out was his ability to capture rhythmic qualities in his delivery mm. and a lot of things you didn't here in the recordings, like if you were listening to the recording, you couldn't really pick it out, but it was in there. And if those little things that he was doing in his vocals, either on the lead or in the backgrounds weren't there, you would completely sense and feel and hear a difference. It all goes oh, yeah. in there and makes something really special. Yeah, you feel everything for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, 
just briefly, can you talk to me a bit about, you know, being in This Is It, such a grand production, you know, with yeah. such new, innovative technology. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a bit about that sort of sense of responsibility being one of Michael's only four background vocalists, you know, having yeah. to bring something of your own to the team as well. Very much so. And you br that's a very good question. And you can see from those pictures, when I see yeah. those pictures of, of Judith and Dorian and Daryl and myself, I see four individuals. I see four people exactly we each look at our stances right we're all bringing something of ourselves yeah. to this right and michael wanted that michael has always if you look like if you look to earlier tours with dorian and daryl they were up there you know dressed and they had a vibe and each one of them he showcased he brought them out he wanted yeah. everybody to be a part well, he did that with his brothers, you know, everybody had their place and everybody brought something to it. It wasn't just the Michael show. He recognized that he surrounded himself with people with talent. Certainly there's lots of talent in the world. You have to be able to identify the talents in each person that you're bringing and sharing the stage with what they're adding to your music. Right. Because if you had four other singers up there, it would be different. It, it, I bring yeah, my yeah. own human experience and interpretation, even when I'm trying to sing the parts that I'm being tasked with as closely as Michael did them, or another singer that was in that grouping when he originally recorded them. I, I cannot help but have it be infused with me. So, and when I'm on stage and you see me visually, you know, you see my stance, Dorian. To, so Mike, Michael got all that. Um, and it is a huge responsibility. And Kenny Ortega, made it abundantly clear to all of us that this was, we all had a very uh, big calling. Michael had been mm. off out of the scene for a, a while. Um, people didn't know what to make of that anymore. Was he done? Was that it? Did he have anything left in him? What was this going to be about? And he was, you know, getting his, all, everything together. When you stop touring, when you stop working at that level all the time that he did for most of his entire life from a child all the way to, you know uh, to an adult you develop yeah. a stamina emotionally physically spiritually your voice your movement your your focus everything you're a honed it's like it's like taking an olympic athlete who's been training for 8 to 10 hours a day for 5 6 8 years or whatever and they're killing it and they're doing great. Now you tell them, okay, don't do, don't, don't work that hard. Go relax for a while for the next few years and then come back. Oh my God. The climb back to that level. Of yeah. Work, how do you pick that back up? You don't, you have to, it is so hard. And this is going to circle to a question you had about working with Kenny Loggins and Richard Marks, but really Kenny. Um, so Michael, the level of effort that it was taking him to get him back to the level that everybody expected him to be. Now he's 50 and I'm sorry, but when you're 50, you'll know what I talk about <laughs> to do it at 50. What people saw you do at 30 or 25 or 20 or 15 or 10. It's not the same thing. You just yeah. don't have the stamina. It just takes a lot more out of you to get there. So it's, um, it was a huge responsibility for all of us. We were told and reminded by Kenny that he was looking to us to help lift him with our energies mm. and our devotion, with our attentiveness to being the best we could be, to being present, no egos, no, pardon me, I don't know if I can say this in your show, but no bullshit, nothing. Just we're here to do something very unique and very special and something that was that the yeah. world would have never seen. And that landed very strongly in all of us and we all got it. We all really, really did. So it was big. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. If only we, you know, got to see the entire show. Yeah. But it's not a stretch to say that you undertook numerous roles, you know, as a vocalist on This Is It. Mm-hmm. You had to sort of act and perform and do choreography as well. So yeah. talk to me a bit about, you know, was that an additional challenge for you? Because I don't <laughs> think that's really the norm, you know, on most tours. I think Michael was a different level. And yeah, it was. Who, who choreographed that? Was that you guys or would one yeah, of the choreographers sort we of come were. into? 
No, we were doing it ourselves. Uh, Dorian and Daryl had obviously already done this with him. Uh, yeah. So we were incorporating a lot of things that they had already learned. Uh, a lot of which mm -hmm. was very foreign <laughs> to me. <laughs> I wasn't, you know, all the MJ and Jackson five moves and stuff. That was yeah. not my thing. Although when I perform, I do move and I've got my own swag. But when you're doing that kind of stuff, that is oftentimes movement um, uh, rhythmically counter to what you're singing. It can be very challenging if you're not used to that. We would, yeah. So we we were like when we were at the Staples Center. No. The forum, uh, we had a room downstairs that was uh, glass. It was glass. It was like a place to practice all that. So we would sit there and we'd put the tracks on and we'd act like we were holding the mics and we were working on our steps and we're working on different yeah. choreography. We were going song by song by song because the choreographers were so inundated with what they were doing with the dancers. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And with Michael, they were always working together. So mm. we were down there working together, the four of us, and it was really a very special part of it. So we're coming up with our choreography for sure and things, choices we were gonna make and refine yeah. and refine. As the concert started, every time we did a show, we would have checked in, did that work? Maybe we can try it this way next time, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. Yeah, it must've been pretty tough, you know, on top of, or the, you know, maintaining yeah. your voice. Yes. Wow. Yeah. We've yeah. had another question here from sure. a viewer. Mm -hmm. Let me get it up. Here we go. What do you think is the most underrated Michael Jackson song? Underrated? Wow. Hey, DJ. Um, underrated. Wow. That's a hard one. Good for question. Me. That's yeah. a good, really good question, DJ. And I don't know if I would ever think of anything being. Honestly, DJ, I wish I could give you a really good answer to that. From my frame point, I think anything that certainly came out commercially always lived up to. Um, Yeah, boy, it's a great question. <laughs> really good question, DJ. I I wish I had a good answer for it. Um, but it's hard for me to answer that because I think when people heard Michael's stuff, they were always pretty like, wow, that's that's yeah. pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, maybe certain songs didn't get the attention that they deserved for a variety yeah. of reasons because they were not you know, those are decisions that are made by record companies, what they promote, what they put out, what they focus on. Um, but what springs to mind? But it's a really great question. Uh, I mean, nothing necessarily totally springs to mind on that front. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, sorry. Those springs I wish to I could mind, give you yeah. a good answer on that. I feel bad about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. But fair enough. I mean, Michael, you know, hit after hit. Am I right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I'd, I'd like to move on. I mm -hmm. I don't want to linger on this for too long. But yeah. Can you just talk to me a bit about that moment where you found out about Michael's, you know, unfortunate passing and then the whole sort of immediate aftermath, you know, the few yeah. days after that? It was devastating. I mean, you had people, you had everybody there had devoted an enormous amount of time. The band had already been working at this for months before we as singers even came on board. The dancers, oh my God. Uh, crew crew giving up major tours, people in the band giving up major tours to be with be in the Michael Jackson band because it was gonna be so unique. I know I, I didn't have anything on tour, but uh, the minute I said yes, I was there five, six days a week, 19 hours a day. 16 to 19 hours a day. It was, you know, for months. it was grueling. You, you were making a commitment towards something that you just felt and believed and knew was going to be part of history. And you wanted to yeah. be a part of that and you wanted it to be great. Um, and I just put out a self-produced record that was getting airplay over in Europe. So I had all these plans on our, on days off that we did have to take the channel over and do little concerts and promote everybody had you would hear that story from every everybody had their own little story their own plans yeah All so it affected day. your personal career path as well then everything everything because a lot of times you have to build a record overseas you know the united states is a very weird 
messed up market and very particular and very controlled. So sometimes you can go overseas and people are so much more open to hearing all different kinds of things. You can build your, start building your career as an artist there. So that was part of my plan. So it was just devastating. Um, yeah. It was, it was heartbreaking. It was, it's taken me, uh, it took me quite a few years to be quite frank with you. Uh, there were a lot of moments of just, wow, wow. What was that all for? Mm. Why did that happen? What was that all for? <clears throat> um, yeah, really heartbreaking. Um, Absolutely. I'm glad that we were able to, you know, all collectively say goodbye to him at the Staples Center. That was, I thought, a really beautiful uh, and appropriate oh, yeah. way to to recognize Michael um, and give us all the opportunity to kind of pour <laughs> pour ourselves into in, whether we yes. were singing stuff or backing other people up. It was at least a conduit in front of mm. the world to say, yeah, we were, we were actually doing this. This wasn't happening all in our heads. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was a remarkable moment. That was, how, just... how did that pressure then, you know, performing at that memorial compare to rehearsing for what would have been, you know, his most hyped show yet? Cause that's a totally different sort of ball game and feeling surely my back was completely going out of me every time we stepped off the stage i thought i'm not going to be able to oh, oh i thought i'm there's no way i'm going to be able to get back up there there i i'm yeah. not going to be able to get back up there so you, what you're looking at a, a, there is a guy that each time he got on the stage just allowed himself to get caught up you know every, in that in all that love and just push through and persevere and uh and show up and that's what you had to do that's what everybody had to do that's what Michael yeah. had to do. Remember, Michael physically had issues with his body, with his hips, with his knees. And yet he was still out there dancing and doing everything. Every day he was working with Lou Ferrigno for like a cut. It was incredible. <laughs> his work schedule was more, was much harder than any yeah. of ours. So if Michael could do it, we could do it. And that was, I think, the attitude we all had. It's like, hey, man, just suit up, showed up and get out there and make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great answer there. Now, DJ has gotten back. We've got <laughs> a second part to the question. Are there any songs you would have liked to have seen added to This Is It? So maybe something you didn't oh, get to rehearse or perform? Wow. Maybe a personal favor even? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, to be honest with, with you, DJ, it's have this amount of time having passed since and so many, <laughs> so much life and career and everything to this day. I, I don't know that any particular thing comes to mind. I think that the show was incredibly well balanced. We were working on. Oh, DJ, I know I'm failing you horribly here, buddy. I'm so hard. So sorry. Um, but uh, was the song Butterfly? Butterflies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. We worked that up. We worked that no up way. locally and we thought this might be a part of it. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And the way we were sounding uh, as the, uh, the, you know, the four of us on vocals and it's like, wow, this is going to be really cool. And it didn't cut, it didn't cut, it didn't, it didn't make the grouping. So there yeah. were a lot of those DJ there. Yeah, when you think about Michael and his body of work, it's like when I first started working with Elton, I got a mm -hmm. tape of like 30 songs, 30, 30 songs, 30 and songs. It still didn't contain all the songs that I thought I would have wanted to sing. Somebody yeah. as prolific as in Michael, as an Elton, they have such an extraordinary career and so many songs that it would be endless. And it, and it's very difficult for artists to really call all that and really get down to what they want to really say in a tour. Um, and in this yeah. case, it's not promoting a new record. If you're promoting mm. a new record, it's one thing. Okay, here are a bunch of songs from the new record, and here's all the hits you want us to do. For Michael, yeah. this is very different. So to look at an entire breadth of your career, um, yes. And yes. Sort of narrow it down there, pick six yes, months. Yes, very good. It's I'm tough. seeing that. It was one of the highlights in Invincible. Yes, stunning yeah. song. Um, absolutely, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Billy, yeah, Billy Jean. Yeah. That was a blast. All those great hits were a, a blast, but you, you know, all the MJ fans, Stranger in Moscow, yes, thank you. Thank you, Robert. See, my brain. 
Stranger in Moscow was so stunning, and we worked on that one too. Yeah, and it, it didn't make it. It didn't make it. They had to make some very big decisions on what was going to make the create the arc of the show that Michael was looking for. Yeah. So you can imagine the task at hand to look at all those kind of songs yeah. and have to decide what you're going to include and what you're not going to include. So, yeah. Yeah. I spoke with Travis Payne. Yeah. Who told me that they did some sort of thing online, like a poll almost, where the fans could choose the songs they wanted to hear. Yeah. So then, you know, Michael did sort of perform the best known hits. And most of the time, that's what you get. It's like Elton was yeah. putting out records for years after his great, you know, his greatest records. And even when I was with him, it's like there were songs we would have loved to have done. But, you know, that people don't want to hear them. They want to hear the yeah. hits. They want to hear the things. And I understand that. That's why it makes it very difficult for a prolific uh, artist unless they get a hit off a record. It generally doesn't get performed that much because that's not what the fans want to hear. They want to hear what mm -hmm. what reminds them and what you know brings back those memories. Right. Yes, so, Michelle, I would agree. Michael certainly one of the most extraordinary, if not the entertainer of the 20th century, for sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, looking back on all those This Is It rehearsals, Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite memory of Michael? You know, does a certain anecdotal moment come to mind? Yeah, I saw that question. It does. Michael, I don't know what this cologne was. I swear you could, it was so potent. <laughs> it's so amazing. <laughs> it was amazing, but it was powerful. And I would smell it about five to 10 minutes before I would see Michael. <laughs> I swear we'd be like, well, you're in this huge, you know, you're either at, when we at the forum at Staples Center, you're on this big stage. Right? And all of a sudden we'd be there and you'd begin to smell. Oh, Michael's here. <laughs> and then it would get stronger and trying to, oh, there's Michael. He's here. He just, you know, it was. Oh, I could only imagine what that cologne cost per bottle. <laughs> but it was so amazing and powerful. It's like, yep, yeah, the boss is here. <laughs> Best behavior. Best behavior. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, talk to me a bit about the sort of interactions he had and the dynamic with you guys and with the band. Well, you know, he he mostly when he was working with the band, he would often put his focus with the band through Michael Bearden. Yeah. Um, but he would address sometimes each individual musician, depending on what he was wanting from them. With Orianthi, sometimes it was like, hey, Ori, I want you to. He was she, unbelievable guitar player, but he wanted her to really own more space as a performer, especially in the interactive mm. moments. Right. Um, so right. he would reach out to different players, reminding them, oh, I, that that note is missing or I'm missing a thing. But, or can we look at that beat for a second or Michael that um, and with the singers, because it was the four of us blending together. Uh, I would say that Dorian was his Dorian, I would consider was kind of his uh, was the leading us. And yeah. um, and Dorian and Michael, along with Daryl, they had a very strong, long history with them. Um, but Dorian was kind of the leader in that regard. So uh, right. if there were things that came up that they wanted us to address, typically he would talk to Dorian. So we didn't have a lot of interaction. I didn't personally mm -hmm. have a lot of interaction with Michael. Uh, there were times on stage when we'd all kind of hold hands together and Michael would be there with us and we'd say a little prayer about the day and how we'd want it to go or uh, things like that. Um but when it was on stage, when Michael hit the stage, it was about the work. It was just about, let's go, yeah. let's rehearse, let's run it, let's fine tune this, let's get it going. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So after working with Michael, before we go, I want to touch quickly mm -hmm. on your work on American Idol. Mm -hmm. You were a first line judge. And so mm -hmm. I can imagine it must have been quite an experience to have to tell these aspiring performers whether they'd make it or not, you know, the entire career. And so surely <laughs> some people would get pretty angry, right? <laughs> okay, so that was a great question I saw. And when you have, when you're in a big arena and you've got four at a time coming up to you, right? Because that was what the initial cattle call auditions were like. 
you had all kinds of people, but mixed in there, you had people that clearly were not quite aware of how things worked or it <laughs> kind of were a little dis, uh, disillusioned or, or illusional, let's put it that way, um, and couldn't understand why they wouldn't get put through. And um, it's because they just vocally didn't have the skill set. And that's basically it. We looked for people that could really sing. And you would hear ex- every once in a while, you'd get an exceptional singer. We would definitely put those through. You Or, hey, tell the producers, you know, we'd put them on to the producers. Um, but then you'd also have singers that were good singers, but there was something about their personality. You could tell they were going to be really mm-hmm. strong performers. So you would put yeah. them through. When Scotty McCreary, I was a first-line judge that first looked at Scotty. When Scotty came up, n- if you would ask me he was going to win that year, n- no way. But there was something about him. He was this kid, this lanky kid, ball player with this drawl, and he had a sweetness about him and that big, that deep baritone voice. And it was there was something very endearing about him. And it's like, okay, that's really cool. That Yeah, why not? Producers, and then I ended up working, and, and a few other people worked with them quite a bit. I worked with them a lot in the first few episodes um, to talk to them about connecting with the audience, connecting with the camera, body movement, awareness. I also worked with them on how to stretch his range a little bit, all these different things. One of the great things about Scotty, which I think is important for everybody to be aware of, is that on paper, Scotty was not the winner. There were other people. Pia Pia Toscana, truly on paper, stunningly gorgeous, mind-boggling singer, uh, you know, probably one of the best they'd ever had and maybe ever had on there. Voted off week five, I think it was, week six. Couldn't connect with the audience. Scotty, it took in, he kept, and by the way, with Pia, I continue, Pia, you're amazing, you're beautiful, you're an incredible singer, you got all the, but you must find a way to feel and let yourself be more vulnerable. Be more vulnerable. Let people in. Let people in. She finally did it her last night when she got voted off. It was a mind-boggling performance of Stand By Me. Everybody was truly weeping. (laughs) The crowd went ballistic. And five minutes later, she was off the show. Scotty Hmm. took your advice. Took He continued to take in direction, not just from me, from everybody, from Deborah Bird, from everybody. And every week, he got better. Every week, he got better. Every week he got better. Every week, yeah, old better. He would get, you know, because it's a popularity contest too. So his numbers, the attention, he was connecting with an audience. He was growing. You watched his audience became a part of that with him, and they watched him grow. And he let yeah. them in, right? It, and he won. He won, and now he's got this beautiful career, and he's yeah. he's been grow and a beautiful family. So, yeah, he came at it the right way. Yeah, so obviously you've got the talent there and also the work ethic, Mm -hmm. but do you kind of look for people who'd just make, like, good TV as well? Well, I'm not supposed to talk about that, Red. (laughs) Oh, okay, okay. (laughs) No, no, there's no NBA yet, of course, absolutely. Absolutely, (laughs) Uh, yeah. We, We even had terms, we had two words, and I won't give that away, but one word meant... This is a serious singer. Look at them. The other word meant this is somebody who's going to make good television. <laughs> and we had to have both. It's a television yeah, show. And I always exactly to, one of my jobs on the show was I used to arrange and organize and and rehearse all the all the talent for those mashups that they did on vote off. Right. And so I would work with the kids at the mansion where they had them. I always used to tell them it's like. Y'all, I said to the all you unbelievable singers in the room, and you know, you all know who you are. You better get your act together because the singers in here that aren't as uh, skilled as you as singers are wiping the floor with you because they know they're connecting with people. And Mm -hmm. not uh, how many times do you see it on a show like that where somebody's singing their brains out? It's not enough. It's not enough. You have to be able to connect. You have to find a way to, to to allow people in and create some level or sense of vulnerability so that people feel a yeah. connection with you. Otherwise, it's not going to work. 
absolutely. That's that's interesting. That so sometimes it's not just about that vocal talent. It's yeah. about so much more than that. That's and cool. I understand that you do a lot of coaching now, right? You worked with Richard Marks, mm -hmm. Kenny Loggins. Mm -hmm. I do. I so in when the pandemic hit, it was the opportunity for me to leave Ambrosia. I'd been with Ambrosia since 2013, had a lot of great experiences, and it was wonderful. But I was ready to move on, and it was the perfect time because I wasn't leaving them in a lurch. You know, their calendar, everybody's calendar got cleared off for. <laughs> yeah. Who knew how long it was going to be, right? So I left, and and because of the advent of Zoom, and it became a way for me to continue to work with clients, with my vocal coaching clients that I'd always had, um, and that began to grow and grow and grow. And Kenny, uh, who, as things were beginning to loosen up in the pandemic, had all these plans for this last couple of years of his career, um, had all these plans, but he was had really fallen into vocal disarray. You know, if you look at Kenny Loggins, and for your viewers who may not know who Kenny is, go back, listen, especially his music in the 80s. Just a mind-boggling vocalist, stratosphere yeah. tenor, incredible songs, just the, the kind of singer that could sing anything he wanted to. And when he'd be on a, like shows with other singers, they'd all be looking at him like with their jaws dropped, right? That kind of singer. But as he aged... As he toured less, as he worked less, all the things that didn't that were working for him began to weaken, and he wasn't getting good information to keep it stronger. And then with the pandemic, forget about it. So in fall of 2020, he I was recommended to him by a couple of different people, and that's when we started working together. And he has been working his butt off. He's blowing people's minds. He's now 76, hitting notes people can't even imagine he can hit beautiful incredible tone and just he's going out the way he wants to he, this is his last year of touring he's he's ending in november with a concert up in at the santa barbara bowl and he's going the way most artists i think would want to go you know feeling like wow i'm going yeah. out, out on top on not, the high. Because, not because for the last five years i can barely sing my songs anymore i've lowered lowered everything by a third that's not kenny that's not who yeah. he is so he's so devoted to it he works harder than anybody i've ever worked with that's like a michael right yeah. you got to remember it's what is it called passion and what is passion the willingness to suffer and Ma kenny would say the <laughs> laughingly yes working with ken stacy you got to be willing to suffer <laughs> because it's hard work this is hard work to strengthen this and yeah. develop this and get all the narratives and all the noise out of the way and stay focused and stay on path and work your system and imbue it with emotion and performance. And when you get on stage, trust that and not let any insecurities come in. And he he's killing it. He's killing it. And, and then so he recommended me to Richard and Richard Marks and I came up right at the same time. We shared some band members uh, together. And I remember no local shows where nobody knew who Richard was at the time. And there's Richard. And then we fall. It was, yeah, it happened all the time. Um, but that record was about to take off and the rest is history. So he and I are the same age. He still is out there singing, doing beautifully. But when I met with him and Kenny, he and Kenny are very close friends. Um, he said, Ken, Richard said, Ken, I, I, I can still get out and do it, but I just feel like it's getting harder. It's getting harder. And I feel like I've got this career ahead of me. I'm only, he's 60. We're the same age. I'm only 60 years old. How could this can't, you know, and so we've start we started working together and he it was so beautiful when he was out he was on this really big tour last year earlier this year and last year and he was overseas he was in australia and just doing show after show and on the road he says ken i'm physically exhausted but he said i've never been in better voice now think about that he's 60 now think about all those earlier times and when we all knew him when his career was i've never been in better voice my voice has never been stronger. I get to the end of a show and I feel like I could sing another three hours. So when you really start learning how to use this right, um, yeah. and that's one of the passions I have is not work, not only working with aspiring artists, which I do, and we'll take a moment to talk about that, but legacy artists. I want to help legacy artists. I want legacy artists to continue to have a flourishing career, not just because of 
the the history of the music they made, but because they can still go out and do it and do it with honor and respect and really deliver to the audience that where the audience doesn't have to go, oh, well, I mean, it's, you know, they're old. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I still love the songs and I love them. <laughs> no, I want them to go, oh my God, how are they still doing this? And yeah, it's great to say that. That's what's happening with Kenny and that's what's happening with Richard. And you brought up in one of your closing questions here, which is, I think, a great segue, is that from time to time, as a vocal coach, I'll meet an, uh, uh, somebody comes to me as a vocal client and there's a connection and I recognize something in them. And one thing leads to another and I produce them. So uh, you had asked in your question about things that I might be up to these days. So there's yes. an artist. Um, her name is Claire Kodara. She, her last name was different, but she was in season nine. Kodara is her husband's name, but it's Claire. Look for Claire from season nine of Idol, uh, which was the last season that Dorian was on, right? So they know each other. Claire came to me, uh, was brought to me as a vocal coach. And very quickly, we had a synergy. And so I ended up producing a record on her last year that was covers but it's really, really cool. You can find it on Spotify. It's called Modern Lullaby, Clara Kodara. That's K-H-O-D-O-R-A, Clara Kodara on Spotify. Okay. You look for Modern Lullaby. It's all these really cool contemporary pop tunes and some songs from artists of the past that we completely reimagined in a really more broken down earthy kind of way, slowed them down. Interesting. Incredible voice, incredible singer. So I produced that and then, and I do all the vocal production and vocal arranging. And then she said, look, I really want to do an original record. So we are now writing and producing and starting to put out singles for a, an original record for her. So the first song we put out is a song called The Prayer. We just released it two weeks ago. You'll see it on our Spotify feed, The Prayer. I am a, it, uh, I've uh, uh, submitted it for what I hope will be a potential Grammy nomination for best, um, uh, best Alternative Music Performance. And we're getting ready to put out another single. Um, and she's really amazing. So I've done that. Um, there's an artist named Anastasia Lynn, Anastasia Lynn, L-Y-N-N. -N. I produced co-produced a record on her a couple of years ago. Stunning record. I think your fans would really love it. Um, and it's called Girl with the Hourglass Eyes. So I do that. I work with clients. Yeah. I've got clients that I'm producing stuff for them, producing demos. I do vocal arranging. I, a few years back, got brought in to do the vocal arranging on a musical for, for Elton. They brought me in and I put together a vocal ensemble and did that. So I'm a vocal coach, vocal arranger, songwriter, producer, vocal producer. I've got an artist, a client of mine from Wisconsin coming in. Uh, he arrives tomorrow and we're going to be tracking three songs for him and I'll be doing all the vocal work here. So yeah, I'm still very much involved and yeah. still occasionally get out there and do something myself uh, in, you know, little shows here and there. And uh, yeah, uh -huh. so that's what's going on these days. Super busy. Wow. Doing you know, <laughs> so many different roles. It's so interesting how your career has sort of taken you so many directions. You have to read one of the things I've learned and you, you, is there anything that you've, and I don't, I want to read your question because it's a great one. Is there anything that you've learned during your career that you can pass on as advice to those aspiring to work in the music industry? Absolutely. And I think we've kind of talked about it, but it's, yeah. it's worth re-mentioning. Uh, perseverance, which you said, and yeah. passion. You have to truly have a passion. And what does that mean? It means you're willing to do what, what needs to be done, which means sometimes it's, as a matter of fact, a lot of times it's hard. Growing is hard. Being better and better, being at an Olympic level, that's what you're aspiring to be. Artists are athletes. Singers are athletes. You have to look at that, look at it that way. You have to be willing to commit yourself and have that passion and you must endure right? My career has right. had so many ups and downs. I could not, we could talk another hour and a half just about that. <laughs> Honestly, and I'm not exaggerating and like hair and on end kind of stories. But I'm still here and here I am talking to you because quite honestly, Red, 
I don't know truly in my heart. I can do, I'm a bright, intelligent person. I could do a lot of different things if I, but I don't want to. This is what I do. This is what I, I was put here for. But I, with whatever God-given talents I've been given, just like a Michael, just like not I'm comparing, I'm not comparing. We nobody compares. Michael is Michael, Elton's Elton, Ken is Ken, yeah. red is red. We're all human beings. Exactly. We're all here for a purpose. The question is, how willing are you to commit yourself to discover what that purpose is? and commit yourself to it. So anybody aspiring to be in this industry, in this crazy industry that is changing day by day, where it's harder than ever to monetize your art, right? Boy, you better be passionate about it. You better mm -hmm. be one because now talk about being lost in content. When I was coming up, if you didn't see it in a record store, you didn't see it. Now I can go online and it's endless, endless array of content. And look, how do you know what to look at? How do you know? Overwhelming. What it's overwhelming. So, oh, here you go. So learn the business. Learn the business. You all young people coming up, you've come up in this box, right? You've come up on social media. You've come up on, on Spotify and Pandora and this and that and what uh, X, TikTok, right? And all these things. <laughs> and, and all things I don't even know that you know, right? Learn about them and learn how to be a business person be a business person yes you have to have a craft of artistry and be committed to that but you also have to be a business person you yeah. have to know how because of the idea that you'll be discovered that that nonsense just let that go discover yourself you want to be discovered discover yourself find where you can find your place in this world of creativity and art, find a way to make it relevant, find a way to get people's attention and get out there and do the work. Um, and that's what you're, and after that, I can't tell you what's going to happen for you because I always tell clients that come to me, I can't make any promises to you. I don't know where this is going to lead for you. Nobody does, right? The Beatles didn't know they were going to be, be the Beatles, but yeah. they, but they kept going. Even after countless rejections, they made music because they had to. Michael kept going. He kept going. He could have stopped. He could, this is enough. I just want to be a kid now because he never really even had a child. And yeah. Nothing conventional, right? But he yeah. kept going. And you, we see the success and think that was a foregone conclusion. It wasn't. It wasn't the Michael. So much goes into it. Oh, and every time he had to recreate me, that didn't just happen because Michael's Michael and he was anointed. It happened because he worked his ass off and continued to find a way to keep relevant. And I'm telling you, you talk about a passion and a willingness to suffer. He kept going. OK, so yeah. keep going and be be aware and keep educating yourself and approach this as a business person. Wow. What can I say? <laughs> Ken Stacey, it's been such, such a pleasure chatting with you. And it's been insanely, insanely insightful, you know, hearing your experiences and also, you know, learning from your wisdom. So thank you very, very much. Well, Red, thank you. And thank you for your patience. I know it took a little time for us to make this time happen. And I just want you to know it's I'm worth it. so incredibly impressed by you and by your show and your questions and your thoughtfulness. And, um, you know, you don't always feel that uh, when you're in an interview. And um, I'm I'm very honored, very honored that I was able to be a part of this with you. So thank you. Thank and you. Thank you to all the so wonderful well. people that that uh, that jumped on today to watch the show. Thank you, Zizzle. <laughs> there you go. Plenty you. of comments. Yeah. Raylan, thank you all. Bless your heart. Get out there. Live passionately. Such a pleasure. Before we go, do you have anything you quickly want to promote or mention or any social media, website, anything like that? Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, I mentioned about Claire. Would love for you all to go there. We could sure use the support. Uh, it's a beautiful song called The Prayer. It's not religious. It's spiritual. It's a, I think it's a message we can all ascribe to about how each of us decides we're going to meet each day. Right. We all get to make that decision. Um, and there's more to come with Claire Kodara. So maybe find her on Spotify, follow her. You can go to my website, 
uh, www.kenstacy, and that's C-E-Y, dot com. You'll find me on Facebook at, I think, Ken Stacy Music, and also on Instagram, Ken Stacy Music. Would love to connect with you there. Um, and yeah, there you go. More, more shall come. There we go. Well, we look forward to seeing what's next for you. Keep in touch with we'll all with your future projects. Best of luck. Thank you, Thank you again. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Take good care. Bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it. Wasn't that such, such a wonderful conversation with the great Ken Stacy? I'd like to thank you all for joining. It's been so much fun having you all here. And I'd like to thank you once again for all the support I've been receiving on my channel lately. I have plenty more videos to come. At the end of the month, I'm going to London to the Michael Jackson convention, Kingvention, where we'll be celebrating all things MJ for an entire weekend. So if you'd like to attend, you can get your, you can get your tickets at kingvention.com. And I'll be recording a video and hopefully doing some interviews there that I'll be uploading shortly. And if there's anyone you guys would like to see on the channel who worked with MJ, comment below and let me know, and fingers crossed, I'll see what I can do. So thank you once again, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.